Take your Bible, turn to John, if you would. John chapter 1. Or John chapter 9, excuse me, pardon me. And uh, we'll get into the Word of God. And... Uh, Get into our prayer list and listen, people, prayers do get answered. They sure do. Prayers get answered. Yes, Roy. Okay. Can't find a liver. Mm. All righty, we'll uh, we'll put his name on our list when we get to that part of the service. John chapter nine. Is everybody having a good week so far this week? No snow. All the snow's melting off. Got my car washed. Get all that salt off of there, and. Um, so well, that was a lot of fun. Anyway, John chapter 9. Uh, Jesus healed a blind man. We've covered some of this. And uh, we'll go through the rest of it uh, as we move down through this chapter. And starting again in verse 1 to sort of get our bearings and get the background of our story. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, and this stunned them. This was, they were looking for A or B. And Jesus gave them C. Amen. And, and let me just say to you, don't be surprised if you pray to God for either A or B and you don't even know what C is and that's what you get. Learn how to love C. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. I need to pray. Let's pray before we do anything else. Father in heaven, it's a joy to come uh, before your people tonight. Lord, I love these people and I thank you for them. I thank you, God, for their love for you and your word. That's why we're here tonight. I pray, dear God, that your word would be magnified, lifted up. Father, that its words would go deep down into our heart. Show us great and mighty things that we know not. Father, help us to praise and rejoice in you and the prayers that have been answered. Father, in ways better than we ever prayed them. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would bless each and every one that is with us here and those who are joining with us online. I pray, God, Lord, that you would give them a double blessing and let them receive a double portion. Father, for their, for their love and their faithfulness to your word, their faithfulness to your service. Pray, God, that you would just give them grace and help them tonight. Bless the study of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. You know, I was thinking of something that doesn't really have anything to do with um, what well, might have something to do with what we're talking about tonight. These people saw an actual miracle. They knew this man had been blind from birth. It, the, the effects, you know, why, why did most blind people, some still do, wear very, very dark glasses, and that is to hide the appearance of their eyes from, from the outside public because sometimes if they've been blind for a majority of their life or all of their life, uh, their eyes seem to be underdeveloped. Uh, they don't have their eyes quite closed. It does, it's not very appealing looking. And so back in my day, we used to be able to spot blind people. They would be people with big, thick, dark glasses on, and you just knew they were blind. 
uh, because of the glasses. And I, it took me a while to understand why they always, why do they wear glasses? They can't see anyway. And, uh, but it's to cover all of that up. This man may have had a covering around his eyes, we don't know, or he may have just not had anything there and they, people could tell that since birth, this man has not been able to see anything. They could see it in his eyes. They could see that his eyes did not work. There was no questioning it. Jesus does this miracle in the sight of all of these people who are watching on, and they're just absolutely stunned and amazed. And this is causing... Many of them to say, this must be the Messiah. This must be him. Who else can open the eyes of the blind? No one else has done this before. And they, and they were just stunned by the miracle. Now, I have never in my life seen Benny Hinn, Ernest Angley, Oral Roberts, Joyce Myers, um... Kenneth Copeland, uh, Creflo Dollar, what a name to call a, a, a handout preacher, Dollar. Or F Frederick, Frederick K.C. Price was his last name. These guys are all wealth, name it, claim it, supposedly get your healing stuff. I've never seen any of these men perform an actual someone who had been verified you could tell they had been blind all of their life somebody received their sight on television have you it's never been done in many cases these men hire professional sick people or they have an entourage of people that just follow them around. They get in line. They know how to act. They get paid for the act. They get paid for doing what they're doing. And as soon as these people supposedly get healed, that's when they pass the KFC chicken buckets around to everybody wanting them to put large sums of money in. And it works. It works. I've never seen any of these people take someone who had been in a wheelchair whose legs are obviously malformed, no muscle, no musculature, no muscles, nature, or whatever. What am I trying to say? Musculature. No musculature that you can see in them whatsoever. You know that if you were to try to stand them up right then and there, they would collapse. I have never one time seen any of these people Grow legs. Nobody's ever grown an arm on these TV preachers. And yet they are, they are touted as the ones who have the gift of healing. My goodness, look at all these people that laying there on the floor and all of a sudden they rise up and, oh, look, they've been healed. Praise the Lord. That's proof right there. It's not proof for nothing. They're putting it on. It's, it's a show. It is... Boasting of a false gift, which is clouds and wind without rain. And Jude and Peter both described them as wells and clouds without water, because they boast of a claim that doesn't exist. In fact, these same People that I've mentioned to you, they have screeners. People who, if they can legitimately tell a physical deformation, they will never make it up on stage to be healed. Never. 
But anyway, this man was born blind. Everybody knew it. Everybody saw it. Jesus answered, neither this man sinned nor his parents, but, he, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Uh, we talked about uh, opening the eyes of the blind and so on. Um, let's see here. Where do I want to go with this? Let's pick this up. Let's pick this up very quickly. Romans 2, 18, Romans 11. And I know if, I may, if I've already covered this, I'll just go back over this very quickly. And uh, we'll move forward. Romans 2, 18. Knowest, and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou thyself are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, in an, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Romans eleven seven. What then? Israel hath obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath the, or Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Romans eleven twenty five. For I would not, brethren, have you that you should be ignorant of this mystery. This is part of the mystery. Now that we've talked about that is leading up to the end times. And one of the things that I'm that I'm telling you without any doubt in my mind whatsoever. That one of the signs. That God is about to rapture. Uh, his saints from this world to the next is that God opens the eyes of Israel. The elect of Israel. Probably not Henry Kissinger or Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> Probably not those guys. Okay? Um, or Steven Spielberg or anything like that. But, but God has an, an elect number of, of men that he is going to open their eyes, both of them, they'll be not, they will be fully unblinded on this day and they will be able to see everything for what it really is. And this is what Paul calls the mystery. Um, he said, for, the ele uh, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Thus you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. God has a name of the very last Gentile that's going to be saved. What would you think if your name just happened to be, or somebody you knew, their name, your name's already on it. But somebody you knew, you've been praying for all your life. You've been wanting them to be saved. And you found out their name was on the very last name of the list. I'll take that, Lord. I'll, that's fine with me. Amen. Now in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, think about this. What did Satan do to Eve in the Garden of Eden? What did he promise her that would happen when she ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil? That her eyes would be open and she would be as God's knowing good and evil. He promised her light. He promised her enlightenment. But really, he promised her a false promise. He promised her, Alicia, what happens when you activate the pineal gland? When the pineal gland gets activated. Don't look around. You taught me this. Yeah, what happens? It, when the pineal gland, 
which is an actual eye in the center of your brain, when it detects it, when it, I almost said detects. <laughs> Once Texas has left the Union, it, when it detects the absence of light, that the sun has gone down, there's not much light in the house, then the pineal gland detects that and it starts releasing melatonin into your body to cause you to go to sleep. People sitting around at night and they're eating pie and reading books or whatever and all of a sudden they start getting really sleepy and everybody, somebody yawns and then somebody else yawns and then somebody else yawns and well, I think I'm going to bed. I think I'm right behind you. And it just, everybody goes to bed. And then what happens the next morning is that sun comes up through the window and because your eyelids are real thin, it detects that the sun is up, the light is coming in through your eyelids, that light is going to your pineal gland because it deactivates the pineal gland. Pineal gland stops making melatonin and when it stops being produced, then you start waking up when the sun comes out. So that's what happens. But that's, what, that's a, the exact opposite. He promised her light, but what he actually did was darken her mind. So that's what this means, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds, not the eyes. Notice that he said the minds of them which believe not. Ephesians 4.18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Uh, 2 Peter 1 9 but he that lacketh these things is blind cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins First John 2 11 but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that what that darkness hath blinded his eyes now, Jesus said this back in John chapter 9, verse 4. If we go back there, back, back at the ranch in John chapter 9. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about what he means by this. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, very few jobs at this time, the time of Christ, had a night shift. We know the shepherds were keeping their flocks by night. And the angels showed them uh, that Christ had been born in Bethlehem. But very few people, maybe a few guards and soldiers and whatnot, but very few people were awake all night working a night shift. Most everybody at this time depended on the light of the sun, the light of the day, in order to get their work done or accomplish their work. So Jesus said, John chapter 9, verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Now, I want you to think about something for a minute. Um, how do I, where is that? Did I put that in here? No, I ain't. Yeah, yeah, there it is. I'm going to wait on this one. I'm going to have to wait on this one. I have to build up to it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Hebrews 10, verse 5. 
You'll have to wait on the really good teaching I have on this. Some of you can figure it out. Some of you can wait on it. But I, re I remember when it, when it hit me, I wasn't reading this. I was reading another place in John. And I remember as soon as I read it, I went, Oh, that is so cool. And I was reminded of that old soap opera that said, As the world turns. Remember that? Okay. Is that still on? Okay. Anyway, Hebrews 10 verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do thy will, O God. This is what John, this is what Jesus said back in John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. My father gave me work to do. I must do it. And so he says it in verse 7. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus knew what was written of him in the book. He knew he must accomplish it. He knew what parts to do when he was on the earth the first time. And he knows what parts he's going to do when he comes the second time, because he's coming both times. Amen. Anybody who would say, like the Reverend, um, the Reverend Shun Myung Moon of the Unification Church, the Moonies, who used to go to airport. Aren't you glad at least they kicked the Moonies out of the airports? Amen for that. But the Unification Church, Reverend Sun Myung Moon, said that Jesus did not perform that which he said he came to perform. That he failed what God told him to do by dying on the cross. What a shame. That makes me angry. To say that Jesus did not fulfill. And that is up to Reverend Moon, Sun Young Moon, and his wife to fulfill the plan of God for man's salvation. Makes me mad. But there was a lot of people in Korea and around the world that believed that. A lot of people. He had one of the biggest churches. And I'll tell you this. His vast fortunes, the assets that the Unification Church owned, and we're talking about major corporations, stores, uh, grocery stores, um, oil companies. They had money pouring in everywhere. And you know what they were doing? They were funding conservative causes in the United States of America, including the moral majority. You remember the moral majority, Chris? Who ran that? Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell was getting money 
from a front company that was owned by Reverend Sun Young Moon. See, that's how they do it. They establish a front company that is like a political action group. The money's fed into that. That group then pours in large amounts of money into all these political causes. So basically they can get their way. And, and it wasn't just Sun Myung Moon that was donating money to Jerry Falwell's moral majority. So, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. I remember on September 12th, they interviewed the uh, Reverend um, Jerry Falwell about his spiritual take on why this event happened. He said this is God's judgment upon America for the sin of sodomy, the sin of abortion, the sin of this, the sin of that. He says that on September 12, 2001. Five days later, he's coming out having to apologize for saying those words and using that kind of language on the air. Now, why did he do that? The money was about control. It was about control. And, I, and I've said this before. Don't write a check and send it to this church and then call me and tell me that you did. Don't do it. Because it's happened. People have called and said, I give such and such a month, every month to your organization. So I think I should be at least allowed some time to speak to you, Pastor Mike, on why uh, one person was, was under the mistaken idea that she was paying her subscription price to receive the DVDs. Does anybody... Roy, do, do we have a subscription price? Do, do we have a subscription price for the DVDs that we send out every month? I asked Roy because Bonnie was here when I first came up with the idea. And she asked, are we going to, are we going to get like a minimum donation for this? I said, God said no. So we're just going to give them out for free. And we've given out, that was in uh, 20, 2010, May of 2010. So that's been almost 12 years. Alicia, how many packets you think, how many discs you think we've sent out in 12 years? It would have to be in the tens of thousands. And we've never charged a dime for any of them. And this lady said, well, I pay my subscription and I think that should get me at least a little bit of time of yours, Pastor Hoggard, because uh, she was upset because while we were all sick and dying of COVID, that we shut our whole church down, office and everything for a month. And she said, I don't have internet. I don't have anything. I didn't know. And I said, ma'am, if you don't have internet, I said, I don't have a way of knowing who you are or that you even exist. So how can I make you known that we're shutting everything down for a month and nobody's getting a packet for the month of September and October? 
She wasn't real happy. But anyway, that's how it works. I probably took too much time going in that direction. Um, but God said in verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. In other words, it's not about what you gave. Neither hadst, um, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, which the, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth ministering, daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. How many sacrifices did Jesus have to perform? One. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. I really would. I want you to help me pray about the opportunity of having an open discussion with the Catholic priests in Turkana, in front of all the people. I, I would like to be able to do that and hear their argument on why they feel like they must kill Jesus thousands of times a day every single day and eat him in order to accomplish what Jesus said I only need to do it once okay from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool but this is Jesus Showing this is the work that God has given me. This is the way he's given me to do it. This is the, the way he's expected me to do it. I'm not about to take money for it. I'm not about to charge for it. And so if you pay for it, you're a fool. Why pay for something when you can get it for free. Amen. Now Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. This is the work that he's given us to do. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his house. You know what? I just have a feeling that it won't be that bad. It won't be that bad. Okay. I mean, I've watched the old way of gathering wheat from a wheat field. <sighs> Sickle. Sickle. Well, then you're not done. Then they got to be bound up. Then they have to be threshed by hand. Okay? Then depending on whether or not you're in the 1800s or in the 100s, that determines whether or not you've actually got a, uh, a water mill 
like as was out here at uh, Morris Mill. And Morris Mill out here in the big river is the remnants of a water mill. The stream ran the mill, which was a grinding stone to grind all that corn and wheat that they had grown all year long. That was the easy way to do it back then. We have a much easier way to do it now. We have machines that operate on diesel or electric. But I have a feeling that it won't be that hard. Amen? He just needs people to do it. And who can he find that will help him harvest? See, God brought the increase. But he needs laborers to go out into the harvest. And folks, I just think that his burden is easy and his yoke is light. I just think the work that Jesus has for us to do is not hard work. Which I'm all in for. 100%. Uh, we don't have, what time, what time is it? Until we do have time to get into this. Uh, do what? Okay, thank you. I like accuracy. You'll be a good science officer on the Enterprise as soon as they launch, okay? Mr. Spock. Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning. Now, I like this one to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And again he went out and found, uh, ver excuse me, verse 5 again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said, saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his uh, steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first, and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first man, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have brought but an hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have been... which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Yeah. That's not in there, but it's, yeah. Take that thine is and go thy way. And I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called but few chosen. So and, and I'm, I'm going to be dead honest with you. I have. I have grown up. In fundamental churches whether they were free will baptist or independent baptist it didn't matter where whoever was preaching was sure going to magnify and uplift another preacher that was there and say why, he's been serving God 45 years in the ministry and 
God has blessed this man with many thousands of souls that he's going to bring into heaven with him. Surely God's got a greater reward for this man. No, he don't. No, he don't. I don't believe that. I mean, when you got saved, did you not just say, God, save my soul from hell and give me eternal life in heaven? Is that not what you asked for? So what difference does it make, literally, if I, if I led you to the Lord back when we were both teenagers... And you've been on the run, running for Jesus all your life. Building churches, preaching meetings, having revivals, getting souls saved everywhere. Or you were the gay guy that I led to the Lord who soon after died of AIDS. Who's going to get the greatest reward? I don't tell you what he told Abraham. Abraham, I am thy exceeding and great reward. I don't know what you think kind of junk God has for you who's worked 50 years for the Lord and gained many souls and brought in many people and has been steadfast and, and has never missed Sunday school and never done this wrong and never never did this bad and and always worked all your life for the kingdom of God or somebody that you were on the USS Oklahoma on July 6 1941 was it 6th or 7th D-Day and you witnessed to a guy before he died. De huh? Oh, it was December. December 7th, 1941. And you were in the midst of witnessing to a guy. And you were praying with him on the USS Oklahoma. And all of a sudden that half of the ship blew up while you were praying. What difference does it make? Difference does it make? To me, it doesn't. And I don't, I don't like, I don't like the doctrine that says that some people get greater rewards in heaven than other people do because I don't think it's right. I think this story blows that doctrine out of the water because clearly Jesus offered the guys at first thing in the morning a penny. Those that at noon, he offered them a penny. Those who he picked up at the 11th hour, he offered them a penny. And they all went to work for a penny. And they all worked. When it came in, time to come in and get their wages, they're all getting a penny. And the guys that have been working all day are like, well, I'm going to call my union rep. This ain't right. But... They all got paid the same. And he said, isn't that what we agreed to? Yeah. So that's what you're going to get. We're talking about heaven here. We're talking about eye hath not seen and the ear hath not heard nor hath entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those. So what makes you think that there really is something prettier than what somebody else has. We can't even conceive what God's got up there for us. Amen.